So, Disney-infused horror is a genre of storytelling that's become almost its own subsection of the medium. There's just something about taking the innocent, fun, and light-hearted, family-friendly message and branding the corporation tries so desperately to push, and twisting it into something wicked and evil. After all, horror stems from a place of truth, and what better truth to capitalize on than exposing the corporate underbelly of the fake joy painted on Disney's limitless library of products. You tweak the picture ever so slightly, and it becomes disturbingly apparent the length the company will go to to maintain their brand image to stage an artificial happiness to please the crowds and force that infamous plastered on smirk. That stuck on trademark Mickey smile distracting and disguising from Disney's ever present corporate greed, from all of Disney's controversies, from all of Disney's associated casualties. You know things might be kind of wacky when throughout all of history. <laughs> The rumor has it that nobody has ever been allowed to die on Disney property. All victims whisked away by on-site patrol to be pronounced dead, tucked away from the bustling tourism, leaving Disney artificial, legally clear, and above all, the happiest place on Earth. Yeah, any of that shit sound familiar? Fazbear Entertainment, the fictional corporate entity present in the FNAF franchise, operates under a very similar motto, striving for fun, food, and safety. Yeah, how'd that last one work out? <laughs> Ah uh, yeah, the events of the entire FNAF franchise. Clearly there are a few similarities between a company designed to be as corporate and irresponsible as humanly possible and uh, Disney, so uh, yeah, oh, oh, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Five nights at Treasure Island, combining all your favorite try-hard Disney creepypasses into a point and click. Wait, I've talked about this one. Yeah, so remember how I implied I'd be looking at the remake of that demo I reviewed last time? The demo I was under the impression was its own standalone entity that was attempted, canned and tossed out until a team of people picked it up years later to ultimately flesh out and complete the project with the very same blueprints. <laughs> yeah, it turns out I'm a little brainless. That so-called spiritual successor is not only technically not a remake, rather the sixth and final version of the same game, albeit developed by Radiance this time, an entire team of people, but still ultimately led by Anart 1996 present in the team to preserve the core identity and ideas that they've held since that freaking first demo all the way back in 2014. That demo, by the way, did technically include content past night too. Using a 6am skip by hitting O on any night, you can progress further than intended, including messing around in an incredibly buggy pirate Kevin's minigame mode. These are the same game, just took it six years to stop looking like raw sewage. Yeah, I submitted an English paper a couple days late once, I feel ya. But Jesus Christ, I've never heard of a fan game sticking out for that long and not only end up releasing in the long run, but in addition being met with glowing reviews. That's friggin' wild and does nothing but drive my intrigue to check this thing out, man. Even reading the release post on Game Jolt is pretty heartwarming. It's clear from the get-go that buckets of love and passion were poured into this thing. And a game that clearly gets enjoyed developing will almost always guarantee at least a fairly decent level of quality on the output. I still think it's so cool that Anna would stick around for development to see this thing through till the very end. That's some dedication. I touched on the game's core premise in my review of its initial demo that was one of the pioneers in kickstarting this whole fan game trend and how it was based on Abandoned by Disney, an internet short story exploring the supposed truth behind Disney's neglected Treasure Island after its closure in 1999. Man, there seems to almost be an entire community based on creating works of horror from Disney IPs, the Disney parks, and the corporation itself, exaggerating what could really be going on behind the scenes, resulting in creepypastas such as Abandoned by Disney and its genuinely unsettling sequel, Room Zero, Suicide Mouse, another urban legend, and even independent thriller movie Escape from Tomorrow that explores some whack-ass goings on at Walt Disney World. People like giving this guy a gun. I'd definitely love to touch up on creepy Disney garbage sometime in a separate video, but we gotta talk about this white guy first. <laughs> Five Nights at Treasure Island. Now this thing has got its own extensive development history over the course of half a decade, firing through five official versions before finally landing on its sixth and final build with simply Five Nights at Treasure Island, released by Radiance Team on November 28th, 2020. Strangely enough, this thing is only referred to by its full title here and there. In the game, and most promo material, it's only ever referred to as Treasure Island. Uh, maybe to drive the thing away from the associated mediocrity that is usually associated with fan games that stick to the tried and true Five Nights at title template, who knows. But hey, what's there left to do than download this stinky little fan game for ourselves and see just how big of a difference Radiance really makes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to bust in on you like that, pal. Uh -huh. Holy shit, a corporate entity. Uh -huh. It's just me, Mickey Mouse. <gasps> the guy from the cereal commercial who made my piss blue. Water of Vulture, Steamboat Willie. Uh -huh. Say, pal, I'm sure hearing whisper of you tarnishing the Disney name. Uh -huh. We wouldn't want you destroying the reputation of a perfectly transparent corporate conglomerate, now would we? Uh -huh. I've already collaborated with an interdimensional kiwi bird and an Irishman within the span of two months. I'm a little checked out, can we not? Uh -huh. 
I'm not here to stick around. Uh -huh. By golly, I'll just be sitting over here on the sidelines watching you toot along, praising the name of Disney. But be warned. Uh -huh. Take one step on my turf and I'll be buying you out in an instant. I reviewed Five Nights at Freddy's fan games. I'll be reviewing your corpse if I catch you bad mouthing the innocent. So I passed the radiant splash in your typical warning screen with added support for every peripheral under the sun, and we're led into an opening cutscene where Greg offers us, Jake, an open position at the Supernatural Studies Association, or SSA, to once again collect data for them in preparation for a pretty nondescript investigation of the abandoned attraction. After all, you are a pretty broke university student, and hey, nothing screams potential human sacrifice like school credits. And hey, boom, Treasure Island, and after a short jingle, we're taken to a menu screen, uh, even though this is really nothing more than an enhanced version of the very same from that first demo. The cheesiness is surprisingly gone, and something about it here feels genuinely unsettling and cold. It's gotta be the music choice here, combined with photo negative Mickey being cloaked in shadow on the title this time, it's already appropriately eerie. Oh, we got a slick options menu here too, with some extensive standout quality of life and customization features here, even offering a face cam mode, shuffling around the UI to make room for dyed hair and lengthy outros. But hey, what the hell, just as I suspected, sticking around for long enough looks like it'll garner that same infamous jump scare. <laughs> yeah, wanna see my cock come off? <laughs> uh, he's a, uh, uh, he, he sure is gone. Imagine going for a piss and coming back to a mouse pass out before crouching an EXE. Disney couldn't buy me out to come up with anything scarier. So hey, getting into night one, and are you sure these two are the same entity? At first glance, this thing is at least visually so much prettier. The lighting, scene building, camera effects, UI. This looks like a reasonably abandoned place, one that feels plausible and neglected. It's honestly some sick stuff. And at its core, everything's true to source, with the office especially laid out in practically exactly the same way as it was six years ago, props and all. Immediately, the place was way bigger this time around too. Ten cameras to book around and littered with mascot costume heads, posters, the works. The facility's definitely appropriately expensive. Anyway, unsurprisingly, we're met with a phone call from none other than Greg, and it's the same general gist. Photo negative Mickey's come to slip your piss, turn off the camera to lure him out of your abode. Other than the guy not acting like a total asshole this time around, another strange detail to note is that he dodges around calling the thing a suit, and with actual Disney mascot heads scattered around the building, the established difference between what's a suit and what's not is definitely apparent, which is definitely interesting, right? For the most part, while while Treasure Island definitely takes heavy inspiration from Abandoned by Disney, as will become apparent, truthfully it's only loosely based on the creepypasta, with no mention of Mowgli's palace, taken on a story of its own for the most part, and repurposing the paranormal suit from the original story into a more ambiguous sentient entity, with a likeness based on Mickey's more traditional look, almost like the burnt imprint hopping straight out of a strip of colour negative film, and taking on a mind of its own. <laughs> yeah, don't you love it when it does that? From what I understand, anything that isn't a haunted suit is officially referred to as a tune, which is a neat little detail to me, and maybe possibly a nod to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Good movie, good taste, whores. Shutting off a camera to create an instant audio law is the way you'll go about most things in terms of your defense, and how you're gonna deal with clearing your office of most of each and every one of the little bastards that'll come crawling by. New to the final version, though, is the ability to both stand inexplicably still and flick off the lights, though engaging in the latter will temporarily disable access to your monitor both defenses effective against specific enemies. The way the lights work is a little dumb though, in order to counteract the idea of keeping the lights off as much as possible to avoid the players using the system, they'll just disable themselves if they're kept off for long enough so they can't flick them back on again, yeah, fun. I think this definitely could have been alleviated in a much more organic way by giving the player a life or death incentive to drive them to consciously activate the brights again, rather than randomly take away control for leaving them on too long. Maybe it's just by throwing in a couple enemies only visible when the lights are on, for example. Something simple like that, you know? Shrouding yourself in the dark will also decrease your power consumption, which, depending on how often you're checking the cameras, becomes nearly essential to employ. Purely to get by with enough of a meter to reach the end of a night. The thing works basically identically to the way it does in Five Nights at Freddy's. Run out of power and the place goes dark, leaving you totally vulnerable and nearly defenseless to attack. And uh, yep, yeah, that's pretty much it for the core cool gameplay loop. Survive against the horde of critters with a few solid mechanics in your arsenal that bounce off each other more or less flawlessly. I'm serious, the constant influx of creatures encourages and gives you an actual reason to flick through the slew of cameras, checking for an active one to shut off, which becomes more of a challenge the more active the enemies get, as you'll find yourself coming into more and more constant contact with your fair share of dead feedback, scrambling to create a distant distraction. Working totally naturally in conjunction with the two methods of hiding yourself from the other dudes in your corner of the map. You can pull both cards at once too, the challenge more so lying in the micro decision making of whether you want to wait out the enemies that react to the standstill or light mechanics first, or risk racing to find a camera to fizzle out to empty the room of the respective corporate abominations. Speaking of, 
God ain't the cast of characters you're faced with wacky. They'll be gradually introduced over the course of each night by various voices on the phone, with Piss Leak and Mickey kicking things off, followed by the Fresno Nightcrawler. Apparently this thing's meant to be Oswald the Lucky Rabbit with a severe case of no arm. And weirdly enough, Oswald's the only antagonist here who isn't straight up named anything different from what you'd expect. You're stuck in the shadows on most cameras, accompanied by a couple other fun friends you'll encounter along the way, such as that infamously screaming Donald Duckhead, Minnie, a decapitated Goofy, and Mickey with some eye talkers you should get checked out, referred to as disembodied, Impurity, Acephalus, and The Face respectively. Most of these dudes will sort off after you deactivate a camera, though Goofy and The Face will only be affected by standing still and hitting the lights. Again, you can pull off both of these simultaneously, ridding your office of them both if you're unlucky enough to be facing off against the two of them at once. It's a nice balance to have some offset with these fellas, keeps things from getting stale by making sure you're not just waiting around to spam click available cameras if a credit waltz is in. The phone calls you'll receive each night, in addition to some loading screen tips, will feed you most of this info, with messages from Greg and Lisa acting to regurgitate pointers to help you understand each method of defense as well as possible. I kinda wish you had the option to listen to phone calls again after getting a game over. I'd often get overwhelmed on my first try, die, and not know what I was doing wrong until twiddling around with the mechanics a little. I guess that's not a huge deal though, and what the pre-night tips are for, right? But yeah, while I do think the difficulty curve is a little steep in the beginning, feels like five nights worth of incline crammed into the first three, ultimately the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay here is nothing but totally solid and really well-structured. And as far as the core gameplay goes, that covers most of it, aside from one extra oh, gameplay mo- Oh my actual Go Hi again, ho. Huh? Uh -huh. Sounds like you're defying the word of the mouse. Uh -huh. Would be a real shame to figure out what happens if you keep disobeying Disney's orders like this. Uh -huh. What do I look like, a law-abiding citizen? Last time I checked, I don't think it's legal to cross the border with an outstretched limb. You think I have to listen to you? Uh -huh. Don't push me, noodle girl. I'll buy you out. I'll file a season to just beyond your wildest nightmares. I'll absorb your mortal flesh cocoon into my all-powerful empire before you can say family-friendly, diversified, multinational, mass media, and entertainment conglomerate. Uh -huh. On your A to D. E for execution, bitch! Night 3's phone call introduces us to Henry, an intern at SSA, who is currently trapped inside Pirate Kevin's, the only reference to the damn thing in the main gameplay to be found. A pair of doors over on Cam 8, barely open a crack, assumedly leading to the place itself. And hey, once Night 3 ends, that's exactly where we're whisked off to, which turns out to be a legitimately and genuinely fun point-and-click exploration survival minigame. On top of this feeling like a fresh way to break up the main game, albeit a little too short and sweet a pop for my liking, it's a super solid and perfect perfectly fitting dip in the action, and is an equally, if not more, tense part of the game. I feel like this game would alleviate the issues I had with games like Five Nights at Candy's 3 too, which is a game that had a similar idea, throwing in some extra gameplay modes to spice things up between nights. The thing is, in that game though, I feel like the sheer amount of extra content possibly made things a little too bloated purely for the sake of variation, whereas here, you'll only enter Pirate Kevin's twice throughout the entire game, making it feel like an intriguing and special break in the gameplay whenever it's encountered. There are two available flaws to this thing. Floor 1, the one you'll start out in, putting you toe-to-toe -to -toe with the face, which is how you're initially introduced to the thing, and a general idea of its light sensitivity, as the loading screen tip will let you know. If there are eyes, use the flash, and if there are none, stand still. Subsequently, you're equipped with a camera to activate said flash, and a flashlight to scout out your surroundings and search for any critters lurking in the dark. The goal of and basic premise of this area is fairly simplistic given its length. Avoid the face, find a door key, ride down the elevator, arrive at the second floor, generate enough piss to fill a small pool. Oh hey, meet hooks on the game over screen with a shadow of my amputated arm and Mickey's silhouette in the backdrop, isn't that fun? This plays out exactly like some old school point and click horror, no jump scare, no audio cue in the slightest, just an incredibly ominous figure standing there with no explanation. This seriously caught me totally off guard. The scares in this thing can be super effective when they want to be, the environment's looking and feeling just like a late 90s CD-ROM game too, it really adds to the spook factor here. This shit slinger is what that one tip from earlier was referring to, you gotta stand still in front of the dude in order to get him to piss off, and getting past him successfully and progressing through the wooden passageway is going to lead you right to a staff-only door. And using the key found on the bottom floor, you are able to open the thing to an enclosed, trashed room, nonsensical scribbles and ramblings littering the vicinity, both handprints and vague and ominous messages scrawled into the drywall in what I can only assume to be blood. All this with flashes of the Mickey Mouse mascot costume appearing briefly, the space behind him fizzling out, eventually cutting to black. Yeah, anyway, here's night four. This is where the face in the empty Mickey Mouse costume, known officially as simply Undying, make their gameplay debut. With Undying working identical to Goofy, just make sure you're standing still when it enters your office and the game checks for it. Meaning the game can now throw this garbage at you. Yeah, I got absolutely wombo comboed the first time I encountered these guys. 
Oh yeah, this game's kind of sort of maybe sort of kind of scary. Yeah, I forgot. These renders, not just in this lone section, but across the entire game, can be creepy as piss. I'm being totally unironic here. Even the jump scares are pretty solid. Of course, this is a FNAF fan game. Immunity to jump scares is like a canker sore after a hike. It's inevitable. But the way some of these guys are posed under the right lighting, things can get visually tense pretty quick, especially fresh and early in the game. These character designs, while admittedly a little goofy looking in some areas, are for the most part pretty uncanny and make for a spook ass experience most of the time. Speaking of spooky garbo though, boy howdy does this thing throw some random whack ass poo poo asshole dog shit at you, huh? Including, but not limited to, uh, this. Turning off the lights in the office with an enemy presence will overlay glowing white rings in place of their eyes. Sometimes the game will totally mess with you and place rings where there really isn't anybody. Sometimes spawning in a million at once just to be funny. In between nights 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, you're greeted with some unexplained cutscenes from the POV of the inside of some kind of jail cell. There are three of these, a quote unquote Shadow Mickey, known canonically as Mother, gets gradually closer each time. I wish I had any further context. Sometimes in earlier nights, you'll randomly encounter Mortimer or Suicide Mouse from the creepypasta story of the same name, who will appear totally by chance in early nights, dousing the camera view he appears on in black and white, switching on CRT monitors to display the infamous old school pre-show Mickey Mouse render, and replacing any and all posters with the image as well. This is honestly just more genuinely cool than creepy, I really love this dude's design here. Pluto will sometimes spawn to the far left of the office in total darkness, do nothing, and promptly come and go as he desires, asking us all the infamous hypothetical, what is the dog doing? Oh, and also I totally freaked out when I first saw the bastard and I couldn't get rid of him. Hey Radiance, come here so I can give you a fat smooch with my steel plated hammer. Sometimes the screen flashes akin to FNAF 1 with character renders and splash text occasionally reading abandoned by Disney. I don't know, I just thought it was a fun detail, lol. Well. <laughs> and hey, with all this counted for, and right, with everything I've discussed here, I think it's safe to say the game as a whole reeks of polish. It feels like every corner of the thing's been calculated and perfected to hit that sweet spot, rolling some decently entertaining gameplay, variation, and spooks into one, making the entire package just feel so crazy well executed. And with so much good going for it, I'm honestly surprised at just how well this amount of content simply works for a fan game. By now I'd usually have a couple qualms to take note of, but here? <laughs> night 6! Beating Night 5 will grant you a post-night phone call from Greg informing you that there's been a few issues over a base, meaning you'll be staying over for another night and oh... Uh-oh. What's a decently rated Five Nights at Freddy's fan game without a final boss? Night 6 flips the script and melds each enemy into one amalgamation of pure Disney contortion, spawning one of the single most unsettling character designs across the whole game known only as Hourglass. And come on, that's a pretty badass feeling name. The thing's absolutely battered toothy Mickey head is the cherry on top of this chunky inky black abomination and appropriately combines each character's game mechanics into one. And the way this thing works is seriously cool. Depending on its starting point, you'll either have to shut off one of your characters cameras, stand still, or shut off the lights, the methods of defense required against it correlating with which character's usual starting point it begins in. Yeah, big milk guy, huh? Huh? You drink a lot of milk? Okay, how many grams of protein does 100 mils contain, bitch? Oh, I'm sorry, did you forget? Oh, I'm sorry, were you not paying attention the whole time you were drinking the milk? You were never, not once, ever given a reason to pay attention to where any of the dudes over the previous five nights spawn. And while the concept of shoving a variety of attack patterns into one beast is novel and in theory could work super well, I, come on, who's gonna remember which gremlin gets spat out where? I can think of a few ways to tweak this fight to make it feel much fairer, but if we want to go ahead and keep the memorization idea and the fight as a whole as close to source as possible, here's what I'd do. Simply base the defense you gotta use against Hourglass on the character pose it mimics when that character's usually in your office. Goofy's usually up close and personal with his hand clambering over the CRT, well from past experience you know you gotta stand still when he's there, so Hourglass sitting in exactly the same position will trigger force a habit and have the player hopefully assume that they gotta pull the same tricks to get rid of it. Oswald's usually way over yonder, so seeing Hourglass crouched over in the same posture should encourage the player to flick off a camera. With some additional difficulty balancing, I feel like this would've been a way safer bet for the final fight. After all, you'll have now naturally gained a pretty good idea of which enemies land where in your office over the previous five rounds, so spotting each position with Hourglass in your office would have been uh, sexy and awesome and not total bullshit. At least you got a cool variation of the game over screen every single time you die, <laughs> I don't know. When I'm drawing a map of your fan game location to plot symbols to each camera view because I can't defeat it sixth night the way it intended, yeah, I you know something's a tad fishy. I'm also the girl taking beating a bullshit final boss in the Five Nights at Freddy's fan game this seriously, so feel free to take my complaints with just a truck ton of salt. There are a couple more interesting details to note with this night though. The fact that Mother from the earlier post night cutscenes appears every time you flip the monitor down, and the fact that we got another call from Henry, still trapped in Pirate Kevin's, who, after days of trial and error, figured 
figured out the passcode to access the third floor of Pirate Caverns, 3497. So, after some literal hours of dedication and glancing at the wiki, which gave me a flawless method of checking where Hourglass is, being the thing on my third try using it, I finally beat Night 6, and upon beating it, we're taken right back to Pirate Caverns. It's the same just as before, go down the says go for the key, well, dash to the elevator, head for floor 3, and we stop in front of a door with a keypad, and hey, punching in 3497 unlocks the thing. And after navigating a tiny corridor with Mickey silhouettes plastered all over the walls, leading us toward an open vault, we're met with a warmly lit yet ominous room, packed with drawings and sketches of various Disney characters. Framed references pinned to the far wall, a soft light pointed at an animation desk featuring artwork of Mickey and Oswald. And no sooner for the player to take all this in does Mother appear one final time, blackening the space behind her and teleporting closer to the camera, inverting itself, before the scene cuts to black and we hear... Now hey, I could sit here and pretend to understand this, so... Hey, let's do that. Whoa! Holy shit, bro! Not unlike a lot of admittedly well-built fan games, without delving into the thing for further context or meaning, I don't know what any of this signifies. I think it's safe to say Jake is possibly a tad uh, dead, probably maybe, but it is a cool sequence regardless. And once it ends, we're met with a surprisingly charming credits roll, featuring everyone who works on the thing from start to finish, and featuring screenshots from the very first iteration of the game. I actually think this is kind of sweet. This thing's technically been six years in the making, so to acknowledge the earlier versions this way is really cool. But hey, we ain't done yet, because Beaten Night 6 does unlock a couple things. Firstly, we have Classic Mode, which is an early build of the entire game, as a single mode, and a Custom Night, yup! To be fair, it's really nicely put together. Not only are there several challenges you can complete, pitting you up against a variation of enemies each time, there are also six extra unlockable dudes here, exclusive to this mode. You got the classic versions of both photo-negative Mika and the face, the photo-negative mascot costume from the abandoned by Disney creepypasta, Pete and Mickey, or Willy, ripped straight from Steamboat Willy, and, uh, Spike the dog? Okay, sure. Honestly though, he does kind of fit in with the whole classic vibe these extra little critches give off. You already got the six-year-old versions of two of the main cast, the suit from the story that inspired this fan game, written all the way back in 2013. I think Sparky's just a neat addition that adds to that late 2014 aesthetic era. At the very least, it's cool to see what was once nothing more than a hoax implemented into a decently built fan game to some capacity. As for mechanics, the only new garb I brought to the table in custom then come in the form of the way both Pete and Willy work. Pete invisible on cameras, with a red flashing beeper indicating his position, as you'll have to view the camera zone to get rid of him, and Willy essentially acting like and these two work pretty swiftly in conjunction with one another, piece mechanic requiring you to check through cameras, with Willy there to keep you on your toes as you do. As for specific challenges, uh, there's a quote unquote nightmare mode, i.e. 720 mode, pretty fun, like a souped up night 5. Uh, there's also a true nightmare, i.e. 1320, including the extra characters, which I wholly recommend if you got uh, several hours in your sanity to spare. As unforgiving as fighting against every active enemy at the same time ramped up to the max is, every failure genuinely did feel like I was learning something new each time, and that losing was very rarely ever bad RNG. These mechanics just work together, and pretty effortlessly, making the final push to 6am totally worth it. Subtracting the three days it took me to finish the damn thing. And hey, beating the thing gets you a neat looking teaser cutscene for something, and holy shit, numbers! Anyway, that was the bulk of Treasure Island, and honestly, aside from the jank ass hourglass final boss and a couple minor nitpicks here and there, I'd happily go as far to call this one of, if not, my very favorite fan game of all time. Dude, I'm being totally serious. From the mechanics to the visuals to the character designs, the variation in cutscenes, the occasional post-night game mode, an entire legacy version of the game included, a well-structured and fastly tightened custom night, and overall difficulty balancing. Everything this tribute's got to offer has some real charm and care behind every last element. You know your shit's good if I'm out here praising the options menu. Also, I don't know how I've gotten this long without mentioning the 20 track long OST either. A lot of this just hits the mark so well. It's a fantastic atmospheric album, all around sounding pretty goddamn baller. I think as a whole, Five Nights at Treasure Island fully embraces early creepypasta culture and rolls with it especially with the inclusion of more than your average fan game's fair share of community-created internet monsters. It's a little cheesy, but it knows that, and it doesn't try to be anything it's not, resulting in the absolute payoff that is this fan tribute. A surprising lack of piss yellow chunk blood this time around, though, got to dampen the score a tad radiance. The game feels perfectly sized, too, and not at all bloated. If you want a decent, well-rounded fan game experience, this definitely isn't a bad pick by a long shot. I'd definitely give a recommendation for this thing. I'm still kind of unsure of what the whole deal with the first pirate cabin section was, though. I mean, we never left the place, so I'm guessing it was from somebody else's POV, uh, possibly Henry's, and in which case, potentially marking Pirate Caverns 2 as Jake's venture through the vicinity, explaining the missing key this time right- <laughs> 
boy. It looks like I meant to oh bargain that Oh my god, it's Mickey, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh. You dare endorse an unlicensed fair use parody containing the likeness of your future god and savior? Uh, -huh. uh, well, my religion already has one, you corporate asshole. I'll summon the ghost of Walt himself to tear you to bloody pieces from the inside out, flesh mortal. Uh -huh. Oh boy, gee willikers, you wanna see what I'm good golly capable of, worm creature? Honestly, most people just call me noodle girl when it comes to names that aren't Gomo, Gomotion, Gomo Gal, Gomtoyon, Gomo Gol, or Gomi, but sure, that works too. You free to wish you a cease and desist sometime next week, I'm kind of busy. You've mocked me for the last time, bitch! Now sign this contract, pal. No. I'll throw in a copy of Sonic Spinball. But what did you leave me hanging for? That's another to add to the collection. <laughs> you fool! You just signed over a five million dollar licensing deal to distribute any and all further go motion content under the Walt Disney Company name. You're my puppet now. <laughs> but, but what? Yeah, I, man, I didn't think you'd really do it. Well, hey, guess before I'm fully transformed into an exact replica of the hideous abomination that is the entirety of you, I can enjoy this nondescript, unbranded plate of egg yolk I prepared earlier. You eat pure egg yolk? Uh, no, every day's a new day though. Uh, say, does this stuff usually spawn inside decapitated photo-negative Mickey Mouse costume heads? Is this negative Mickey blood? <laughs> no! Oh, god damn it! Hmm, what if I- Don't even think about it. <laughs> Well, yeah. Five Nights at Treasure Island is honestly a miracle in the FNAF fan game scene for it to not only end up releasing, but just end up as surprisingly solid as it really is. Everything about it is just so great to some extent, so nothing makes me happier than the fact that this thing is in fact getting its own totally original sequel as a continuation of the game's story. At this point, seemingly totally separate from its origins is a modified abandoned by Disney retelling, branching off into developing its own characters and lore, which is honestly very cool to me. I'm definitely excited to see where they take this stinky little thing. Obelidus Casa, even just from the sparse promo material alone, this feels like it's gonna have the potential to be a worthy successor. And it's clear these games have a whole team behind them that does genuinely care for Treasure Island's core legacy, going as far as to release a special anniversary edition of an earlier build of the game to celebrate its sixth birthday. And with even more remakes and projects on the horizon, Radiance does seem to be one of the most promising feeling fan dev teams out there as of late making me curious, intrigued, and honestly, a little excited for the rest of what they've got in store.